All right, those three verses is our text this morning. I think we can get through them. Never know. The topic we find there, the destruction of Solomon's temple and the deportation of Jews to Babylon canceled Ezekiel from ever serving as a Kohanim in the temple. The title of our message, I could have been a Kohanim. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we sit in absolute expectation of your word reaching between the soul and the spirit of our lives, separating that, Lord, that only you can separate to show us the greatness of your love and your mercy, the wonder of your grace, uh, all the things, Lord, that only you are the author of. As always, we like to pray for people that uh, are here that aren't believers in Jesus Christ, that they would come to know you. And so, Lord, may your Holy Spirit be working upon their hearts to... uh, soften their hearts, to break their hearts in some cases, Lord, and to reveal Jesus as, as they face, uh, you know, the, the wrath to come if they do not know the Lord. For those of us who love you, Lord, uh, may we leave this place on a real high spiritually, uh, just ready to serve, ready to pray, ready to do whatever it is that you call us to do. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, Amen. We recognize certain milestone birthdays and set them apart for special observation and celebration. Age 16, driver's license in most normal communities. I found kids aren't that excited anymore about getting their driver's license. Do you realize that? It's like, I, you know, maybe it's the Uber generation we should call them, right? I practically camped out at the DMV in San Bernardino for six months to get my, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license and drive my 1947 junk Cadillac around so that I paid $225 for and sold for $700. Man, it's probably worth $70,000 today, but what was I? I was 16. I hadn't gotten to 18, which is uh, adulthood, really. (laughs) Yeah. Then comes midlife. I'm skipping 21 because I don't want to get into that. Uh, Then comes 40, usually midlife. Uh, just a couple of years ago, somebody accused me of having a midlife crisis. I said, I- I'm in my 60s. So, I, hey, go for it. 65 years old is the traditional retirement age. Uh, Social Security is making it 165 here soon. But And 100 years old, less than 1% of the U.S. population lives for a century. And that's why when you say, well, how old is he or she? Oh, 100. Wow, everybody goes crazy, you know. In Mexico and other Latin American cultures, the 15th birthday for young ladies is celebrated with quinceañera. In Judaism, a bar mitzvah for boys at age 13 and a bat mitzvah for girls at 12 mark their coming of age. In Israel, among the male descendants of Levi's son Aaron, birthdays at 25 years, 30 years, and 50 years are significant. In Numbers 4.23, we're told, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, Levites enter the service to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting. A few chapters later, we read this clarification. This is what pertains to the Levites, it says, from 25 years old and above, one may enter to perform service in the work of the tabernacle of meetings. From age 25 until turning 30, the Levites apprenticed. Then at 30, they began their service in earnest, and then retirement was mandatory at age 50. I like that. We learn immediately that Ezekiel was a priest entering his 30th year. We'll read that in verse 30, or verse 3, rather. What ought to have been a milestone was more like a crushing millstone because Ezekiel would never realize his life of being a priest. Now, Ezekiel didn't write to us, but what he wrote is still for us. In 2 Timothy, Paul reminds us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for things like doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness, how to live, that we might be complete and equipped for every good work. And when Paul said that, when he told Timothy that, the New Testament wasn't in circulation. It hadn't been put together yet. It hadn't even been written yet in many cases. So he was talking about the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. That is profitable. 
Uh, and so that's why we spend, we spend a lot of time in the Old Testament because it's a profitable place to be. Now, when the Apostle Paul wrote those words, uh, he w- was getting us excited about seeing the fulfillment of things predicted in the Old Testament in the New. Anyway, I'll organize my comments around two questions this morning. How would you describe what Jesus is doing in and through you? And number two, how would others describe what Jesus is doing in and through you? So first of all, verse one, how would you describe things that are going on in your life? You know, I I find this uh, odd, but it, it turns out it's not uncommon for an interviewer to ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I think they're going to catch you sideways or something, and you better have an answer for it. In Israel, if you were a descendant of Aaron, you were going to be a priest, a Kohan, uh, K-O-H-A-N or C-O-H-A-N. Kohanim is plural. Ezekiel knew what he was going to be as an adult, only as we saw, when the time came, it wasn't possible. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem in 606 B.C. during the reign of King Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim surrendered to him. That's what you did to Babylon if you wanted to stay alive. Nebuchadnezzar took some of the temple treasures and some prisoners, among whom were Daniel and his three companions. Nebuchadnezzar returned in 597 BC. King Jehoiakim had died and was followed by Jehoiachin, who reigned for only three months. He was taken captive to Babylon with the remainder of the temple treasures and other prisoners among them Ezekiel. So Daniel goes in the first deportation, Ezekiel in the second. Then the uh, Babylonians rather returned to Jerusalem in 586 BC. They destroyed the temple and the city. Levites were not priests the way we think of them. Zachary Garris writes this. He says, the Levites were not just priests. They were warrior priests. Their priestly origin is based in righteous violence. But God put the violent nature of the Levites to good use. Not only would the priests among them slaughter animals on a regular basis for sacrifice, but also all the Levites would guard the tabernacle and temple and the cities of refuge. Yahweh ordained and scattered the Levites throughout Israel in order to guard his worship. It it sort of reminds me of a Kung Fu movie, right? You know, where the, the Shaolin monks are studying Om or whatever and stuff, and then they go, oh, yeah, blah, blah, and stuff, and they go into all this. So they're warrior priests. Oh. Anyway, what does he mean by righteous violence? Well, for example, when the Israelites worship the golden calf they, coming out of Exodus, uh, or coming out of Egypt, rather, in the Exodus, Moses called for every man to put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And when he gave that rallying cry, it was the Levites who came to be on Moses' side and on God's side, and they killed 3,000 men of the people that day before God stopped them. And there are other episodes in the descendants of Levi and the Levites where they show a, I don't want to use the word violent, but a, that kind of a, 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 you know, a, a, a righteous violence kind of anger. New Testament believers are warrior priests. The church is called priests in Revelation 1, 6. A priest is a mediator, what, between God and man. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. But what we do is introduce people to Jesus. Uh, and then we quit mediation, right? After that, there's no, the, we are not a priesthood in the sense of people coming to us and through us except to know Jesus Christ. But we are called priests, and we are warriors to the extent that we're told to put on the armor of God. But remember, the weapons of our warfare, we're told, are spiritual, not carnal. And so you don't need to go out and learn kung fu uh, and, you know, to, we're warrior priests in a very different warfare. Uh, you know, on our knees kind of warfare in terms of prayer and righteousness, righteous living and living in weakness so that God can be made strong, those sort of things. So how is the warfare for you? What fronts are you fighting on? Where are you behind enemy lines? Are there chinks in your armor? Are you wounded? Are you getting more proficient with spiritual weapons or still trusting in the methods of the world and the strength of the flesh? I mean, there are a million questions you could ask yourself about this. And so verse one, now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, 
as I was among the captives by the river Kabar. Ezekiel was living in Babylon down by the river. Historians and Bible commentators are thankful for Ezekiel's careful keeping track of time. But when somebody is that careful keeping track of days, it communicates a deep longing one way or the other, either positively or negatively. Think of, for example, your kids who sometimes count how many sleeps until you are taking them somewhere fun. I don't remember doing that as a kid. Not that, you know, it means anything, except that my childhood was terrible. No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I love my family. Uh, I don't, uh, anyway. Uh, but I thought that was cute. All of a sudden, the kids start counting sleeps. It's so many sleeps. I, I don't remember that, you know, and stuff. And I thought, this is the cutest thing in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, so Ezekiel, I mean, he's, he's longing for something. His longing is captured in Psalm 137. It's the longing of all true Jews during this time. I'll read it to you. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. We wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of, Israel, of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us, happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Uh, one thing that's interesting here in reading Psalm 137, just to tuck away, uh, we know this already, but the Babylonians considered the Jews a joyous people, a people who like to sing and, ha and be mirthful. Uh, and just were full of that kind of exuberance. And they thought, well, you guys, uh, uh, welcome to captivity in Babylon. You're probably better off than you were in Israel anyway. And so sing us a song. Uh, and, and they, of course, said, no, we're hanging up our harps. This is sorrow for us. Reminds me of that scene in the Lord of the Rings, the two towers. Or is it the return of the king? Must be the return of the king. I spoke heresy last service. But anyway, uh, when uh, Denethor has sent out Faramir to, to his death, and uh, he wants Mary to sing him a hobbit song, you know, to, and then he, he sits there eating, and he's, he, uh, he's just gross the way he's eating, and stuff is dripping down his beard. And it's very, uh, you know, it's very visceral, that scene. And so this is the idea. Sing us a Jewish song. How about Hava Nagila, you know? Hey, you know what? We're not in the mood. We're looking forward to the day that we dash your babies against rocks. So, you know. That, that's our hit song, you know, that's our number one song right now, and, uh, you know, it, it's coming. New Testament believers wait with a deep desire. We wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Knowing I could be with Jesus right now, I am motivated to invest myself serving him today, right? It's a, there's no greater motivation than knowing that I could be with the Lord momentarily. Now, the truth is, the conditions of the Babylonian captivity weren't severe. In fact, when it ended, they could return home, but most Jews chose to stay and live under Persian rule. That's how good their life had gotten in Babylon. Looking around in our world, things are getting severe, but we should continue to say, even so, come Lord Jesus, and not settle in and become too comfortable. Uh, comfort in the world is, is not a good thing. It, it, in fact, um, the Jews always did better when they were under a little bit of suffering. When it was clear sailing for them, they forgot the Lord and uh, began to backslide. So we want to be careful we're not getting too cozy, uh, cozying up to the world. Scholars have done the math. Ezekiel was taken captive at age 25, just when he would have begun his apprenticeship. The first vision came to him, it would seem, on the day of his 30th birthday, when he would have entered the priestly service. God did not need Ezekiel to priest. He needed him to prophesy. And think of, um, in the background of the pathos of, I wanted to be a priest, and I was called to be a priest, and at age 25, instead of being an apprentice, I was taken away to Babylon. 
And can you imagine, I mean, I would have been thinking this, probably you too, as you're getting close to your 30th birthday and you're in Babylon, you're sitting by some weird canal, you're in captivity, your life is in a turmoil, and then you wake up and it's your 30th birthday, big deal, right? It became a big deal, as we'll see in the next verses next week, Lord willing, or when we get together, because God began to give Ezekiel visions. He said, you're not going to be a priest because I don't need a priest. There is no temple. It's been destroyed because the Jews disobeyed me. I allowed the Babylonians to discipline them. What I need is a prophet who can do some really difficult things. The things that Ezekiel is going to be asked to do, uh, some of them are humorous to us, but some of them are terrible. One of them, I think it's in chapter 24, I could be wrong, but one thing he's asked to do is is when his wife dies, whom he loves deeply, calls her the treasure of his heart, God says, no mourning for her. You may not mourn for your wife because he was being symbolic, and we'll see it when we get there, but God says, hey, forget this priest thing. I've got, I've got better news for you. Um, and so, you know, Ezekiel enters into that, and, and the Lord's that way. I mean, uh, am I gonna be satisfied with the Lord or do I demand my own way? I could, am I gonna sit in Babylon for 20 years thinking I'm a priest and, and not really doing anything or am I gonna do what the Lord has called me to do? Again, in verse one, at the end, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. How are we to understand these visions? A commentary I consulted said, one of the unusual parts of Ezekiel's experience seems to be that he was physically taken away by the Spirit of God while the hand of God was upon him and was returned to his place among the exiles at the end of his vision. And so he was having lateral raptures right? Uh, most of the time we think of the rapture as a horizontal, a horizontal situation. The Lord's going to catch us up. He was having lateral raptures from one place to another and then back and forth to heaven so that uh, he could have these visions to share with the people. Uh, Ezekiel was uh, just uh, mind-blowing, as we'll see. Before moving on, I want to mention the modern-day Kohanim. How will Israel identify the priests when they rebuild their temple. Well, Genesis Dr. David Goldstein says this, or points this out, I should say. He says, as it turns out, almost 100% of all men with family tradition of priesthood, in other words, they believe that they are descended from uh, Levi through Aaron. He says, almost 100% of that do descend from Kohanim. Generation after generation of Jewish women were faithful to their husbands and their tradition. What a proud record of fidelity. Geneticists describe these results as, quote, the highest record of paternity certainty ever recorded. Date calculation based on the variation of the mutations among Kohanim today yields a time frame of 106 generations from the ancestral founder of the line that was about 3,300 years ago. That is exactly the time that Aaron uh, was appointed to be the high priest of Israel. And so the geneticists, not, not Christian geneticists, uh, but people who study genetics, uh, research, uh, scientific stuff, they say you can trace the Cohen gene all the way back to Aaron at the exact time in history he was on the pages of history. And somehow, through all these centuries, the Jewish women who were married to Kohans didn't commit adultery. And they kept the line pure so that now in the 21st century, if the Jews want to build a temple, they have a priesthood. And you know what? The Nezer HaKodesh Institute for Kohanic Studies right now in Jerusalem is teaching priests how to perform service in the coming temple. Wow. This is wow stuff. I mean, you know, if people want to talk to you in the break room about what's going on, this is what's going on. Fulfillment of prophecy. Now, how would others describe what Jesus is doing in you and through you? Take time to source a claim before you Insta, uh, Facebook, or X. Have you ever posted something and then immediately found out it was a hoax? Like Whoopi Goldberg and and Joy Behar are not fit for the view anymore because they're too toxic? Sadly, that is a hoax. But... uh, So be careful, just look it up somewhere else. The reason I mention that is because these next two verses, they read like an independent fact check 
of what, of what Ezekiel had just said about himself. They verify what he said in verse 1. And so verse 2, on the fifth day of the month, which is in the fifth year of King Jehoi- Jehoiakim's captivity. Uh, and so now it's going to go to a third person account and Ezekiel is being vetted. Spiritual background check so that the reader can be comfortable that the priest was indeed raised up as God's prophet. Verse 3, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, that the hand of the Lord was upon him there. The literal standard version of the Bible uh, reads this way, the word of Yahweh was certainly uh, to Ezekiel, son of Buzi, the priest, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Kabar, and there is on him a hand of Yahweh. And so it is the findings of this vetting that Ezekiel is a bona fide prophet. Ezekiel the priest is a bona fide prophet of the Lord. He, the Lord's hand is upon him, and he is strengthening him spiritually. Uh, and so we can trust that what he is saying is from the Lord. Now, this lends itself to our talking for a few minutes about prophets and prophecy. There are no prophets today. There are no prophets today in the New Testament sense of the church. There is a gift of prophecy. It is a gift from the Holy Spirit for some believers, not all believers. It is exercised to benefit and bless the church as discussed at length in 1 Corinthians 14. In our fellowship, it mostly takes the form of God the Holy Spirit impressing on a person to call our attention to a particular scripture. And so, for example, on Wednesday nights, we always have a time of prayer where we invite people as they're waiting on the Lord. If the Lord puts a particular scripture on your heart, get up and share that uh, because chances are the Lord wants to share that with somebody in that meeting or somebody that somebody in that meeting knows. And oftentimes several will be shared and they kind of dovetail together to give a coherent message from the word. And you say, well, why would you need to do all that? Well, because, okay, like right now we're here, there's 66 books of the Bible, right? Which one do you think the Lord wants to speak to us out of if, if there's a prophetic word to be given? I don't know. You know, but he does. He knows if I need to hear something or if you need to hear something or whatever. And so we depend on the Lord to use the word in that way. Uh, we would acknowledge dreams, certain dreams, and certain waking dreams that we would call visions as forms of church age prophecy. Now, as to visions, we're not saying that people go into a catatonic trance. Uh, oh, don't touch Pastor Gene, he's in a catatonic trance. <laughs> Probably I just forgot my meds, but uh, you know. And dreams, people call me, it's fine to interpret dreams, and and there are a lot of spiritual dreams you have, but then there's the ones you have because you shouldn't have eaten pizza after 8 p.m. It's just, and what God is telling you is, I I see something pink, and it's Pepto-Bismol, you know, that kind of thing. But um, uh, if uh, if a person's going to speak and say, you know, beyond that, if they're going to say something beyond, hey, here's what the Scripture says, and say, I have an impression that the Lord is giving me or something like that. Well, we want that person to be vetted because of what they, we just need to know who they are. Uh, down, it doesn't happen too much here, but down in Southern California, just about every Sunday somewhere in Southern California, Elijah would visit your church. Not Elijah, Elijah, but crazy Elijah, you know? And um, he'd come into this, there'd be somebody in your church that's you know, kind of dressed weird. And then in the middle of the message, he'd pop up and say, I'm Elijah, and thus saith God. You should get that far before the ushers would tackle him and drag him out, you know, and stuff. And so we didn't, we, we just kind of thought it wasn't Elijah, you know, and, or Jonah, whoever that guy thought he was and stuff. And, and so you need to know who's saying, this is what I think the Lord is saying. And whatever is said, whoever it is, Vetted or not, they need to be judged by the written word of God. The prophecy will never say something that, that can't be agreed with by the word of God. Now, if ultimately the gift of prophecy is the application of the written complete Bible, why do we exercise it at all? Well, the Bible presents it as a gift that has not ceased. I don't have the freedom to ignore it because I don't like it or because I don't want to deal with it or I think it's controversial. It'd be like ignoring another part. If somebody came and said, Pastor Gene, why don't you ever teach this passage? Because I don't like it. And I I don't want to get into it. 
It's hard. A large portion of 1 Corinthians, secondly, is dedicated to the proper exercise of gifts, prophecy being an important one. Why so much instruction about the so-called sign gifts if they were going to cease shortly? I, Paul could have saved a lot of time by saying, hey, just let's wean off of that right now, okay? And let's get into a more of a you know, pastor-teacher situation where there's just the teaching of the word and the congregation doesn't have any sign gifts. There's no prophecy, speaking in tongues, none of that. Paul doesn't do that. He spends chapters talking about this situation. Nowhere can we honestly prove from Scripture that certain gifts like prophecy have ceased. Cessationists mostly criticize the abuse of the gifts. They don't have a lot of Scripture, you know, where they go to and say, now here the Lord is teaching us that the gifts are going to cease. And some of the Scriptures they use, they've had to backpedal on and say, yeah, actually, you're right. Those don't say that. So they spend all of their time criticizing the abuses of the gifts of the Spirit. And you know what? They're right. The gifts of the Spirit are abused, terribly abused. And um, we would say the same thing. But just because something is abused doesn't mean you get rid of it. You do what Paul did. You correct it. You don't say it ceased. You correct it. And that's what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 14. And he talks all about the proper exercise of this gift of prophecy. And uh, he talks about the gift of tongues, as a matter of fact, while we're on the subject. Now, a couple of things, you're going to want to read this this afternoon and, you know, double check what I'm saying. A couple of things to remember about this. Number one, when Paul speaks about the gift of tongues in, the, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, it is distinct from the phenomena of tongues in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible clearly says that what was spoken are known foreign languages. Known foreign languages. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is very clear that what is spoken as the tongue is a not knowable language. It's not a foreign language. It's not a human language. It's a divine language that requires a certain type of interpretation. So you've got to keep those separate. Otherwise, obviously, you're going to be in trouble. And when Paul speaks about the gift of tongues not being uh, edifying, not building up, whatever it might be, it's always uninterpreted tongues that he's talking about. He says, basically, hey, I'd rather you prophesy and say 10 words that I can understand than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. But it says if there's an interpretation, then it can edify. And so keep those things straight, and you'll understand perfectly what's going on in 1 Corinthians 14. So no prophets in the sense that they have authority over you and tell you what's happening. Could God predict the future? Sure. Sure. Does he know the future? Absolutely. Uh, Are are there times when God does really amazing things? Sure, I've told you the story many times, and it's online about our coming to Hanford and how God used a vision that he gave a brother in Christ uh, to encourage us to come. And so I have no problem with that. It's a proper exercise of the gifts of the Spirit in a beautiful, gentle way. We need that. And so that's a little insight, I think. A little rabbit trail turned out to be more of a deer trail. But anyway... (laughs) In Jeremiah, or rather, Jeremiah in Jerusalem had been prophesying for about 35 years to this point. Daniel was just beginning his amazing ministry at the heart of the action in the very courts of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon and then later in Darius's uh, Persia. Ezekiel was stuck in a Jewish settlement, Tel Abib, it's called, out along the river Kibar, which was a canal that connected to the Euphrates River. He was out in the sticks. He was in Riverdale, a nobody, a priest who would never serve in the temple. And so we would ask, is the hand of the Lord upon us here in the sticks by the King's River? Well, one way to determine an answer is to read Jesus' letters to the seven churches in the opening chapters of the Revelation. It's our belief that each letter was written to every church. Yes, the letters are addressed to a particular church, let's say Philadelphia, And they were obviously, that letter was for that church at that time. But they are also applicable to any church, any time they find themselves in Philadelphia-like situation. In fact, there's a point in the New Testament where Paul says, hey, this letter I wrote to you, take it to the next church and read it to them as well, because it's the word of God. And it's not unique to that church. That's what that church needed to hear at that time, 
but later they would need to hear something else. One argument in favor of that, a fact that they all end with Jesus saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, not to your church, not to Ephesians, not to Philadelphia, but to the churches, plural. And so all the letters are for all the church. And another argument that seems to favor that is that the rewards that are promised to each church are available to every Christian as well in most cases. And so we can read those letters and ask, how is Calvary Hanford like or unlike the church at Smyrna or Philadelphia or Laodicea? Would Jesus commend us for certain things or would he criticize us the way he did uh, most of their, and you have to remember, uh, only one church came away completely unscathed, and that was Smyrna because they were suffering. Uh, the other churches all had need for correction. And so I would say we must, and we need to search this out. The heavens opened for Ezekiel. We'll see that a lot in this book. The heavens will open for us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Have you heard the term secret rapture? It's a term frequently used as a pejorative by those who deny the idea that the rapture of the church is separate from the second coming, or that it takes place in the middle of the tribulation. They say, oh, you've come up with a secret rapture that's not taught in Scripture. And they're saying when, when the Lord appears, you know, it's, it's like in Revelation 19, and the whole world sees it and all. And then they say, you're talking about some secret rapture that never took place. There have been some groups over the years that said, oh, this is going to be the rapture of the church on a particular day, and they wait up on their mountaintop, and the Lord doesn't come, and then they say, oh, you know what? He did come, but he came spiritually, and nobody could see it, and so there's a secret rapture. Do you think that graves opening down here at Highway 198 and 10th Avenue is going to be a secret when people are driving by, hopefully not at night, but... Uh, Seriously, I mean, if you're driving, you're there waiting to make that turn, you're looking at the tank, right? And, and, and uh, thankful that you live in Hanford and you look down, all of a sudden the graves are opening and people are waving to you as they ascend into the heavens. Do you think that's going to be secret? What about Christians who are alive at the time and in an airplane, in a commercial jet? It won't be very secret when the co-pilot announces over the comm, ladies and gentlemen, the captain was just raptured. I cannot raise LAX or any terminal for that matter. I suggest you buckle up and receive the Lord, <laughs> right? I mean, that, there's going to be, it's not funny, but we laugh because it's so, it's kind of creepy funny, but there's going to be disaster like the world has never known. It's, there's nothing secret about what happens. I think the Gideons should explore having a Bible in the storage compartment of airline seats. You know, the Gideons do a great job putting a Bible in every hotel room in America. Of course, now the Mormons are doing a good job of that, too. So you've got, you know, got to weigh that out and figure out how to get rid of the Book of Mormon. Uh, if you're not throwing away the Book of Mormon every time you leave a hotel room, shame on you. <laughs> I didn't say that. Well, it's, it's damnable heresy, right? So they have a little tract, you know, in the back of the four spiritual laws, because, you know, when you go down an airplane, you go down pretty hard. Uh, but you want people to know about the Lord. Or maybe Franklin Graham can record a 90-second evangelism video to play, where just, you know, the videos come on, and uh, it's like, hey, because you, you'll need the Lord. But it, there's nothing, there's no secret about it. And um, the Bible does teach that it's a pre-tribulation rapture. If it's not pre-tribulation, then you will know when it is you will know when the Lord is coming because we know when the tribulation begins. It begins when the Antichrist signs a peace treaty with Israel to uh, fight for them for seven years. We know when the middle of the tribulation is going to be. It's when he goes into the temple and declares that he is God. And we know that three and one half years later, the Lord Jesus returns. We know all of those things. And so the only, uh, you know, 
the only one where we don't know where it's imminent and where we're motivated to serve the Lord is the pre-tribulation rapture. Billy Graham once said this, Jesus wants to give you hope for the future. He wants you to learn what it means to walk with him every day. When you come to Jesus, God gives you eternal life, which begins right now as you open his heart, or you open your heart rather to him. Let's pray.